So we're big, we're bad, we're back with another episode of top five stretching into top 10 favorite pieces of equipment. And uh, I'm here with, of course, rather wonderful Mr. Sean Dealey. Happy Good to, to see here. you as ever. Thanks for coming back or staying. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not leaving. Yeah. Although I'm going to leave with some of the gear. So in no particular order, some of this stuff is inexpensive, some of it isn't. This is my favorite compressors and uh, Sean is here to throw in his opinion as well. I'm starting probably near the top of the price range. There are much cheaper ones about to come up, so stay tuned. Without a doubt, this is one of the greatest compressors ever made. It's not uh, maybe as famous as some of the couple of others, like 1176 we'll be touching on, of course. But first of all, I see this in every single mastering studio ever, let alone every mix room. I personally love it when I'm dealing with really, really bright electric guitars. It's not that it dulls it down, it doesn't. It just tames those really spiky, horrible transients and just seems to smooth them out beautifully. Um, it doesn't dramatically change the sound, it just changes it enough that it's like, great on a guitar mix bus. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's one of those like 1% things, like when you want to take it over the finish line, this thing is it. When the needle's moving, it's almost too much compression. Yeah, yeah. So like, it's a subtle box, it has a lot of controls, and like this is the step mastering version too, so yep. recallability is awesome. But yeah, you know, a little bit of love, and like, Manly Stuff and guitars kind of, they play really nice together, but yep. this on a mix bus is also like, it's just a, it's a chef's kiss on that. Yeah, I can think of 20 mastering engineers that have this in their rack, you know? And to me, it's like, that's, that says a lot. There's very, very few things I will stick on a master bus. I am terrified of putting compression on master buses. You know what I mean? If I put something that's not quite... I just feel like, what is my point in spending all that time doing a mix to have it destroyed by... Plugins in particular. I really am scared of putting stuff, plugins on my master bus. You'll get used to it. <laughs> no, but this Maybe. is definitely one of those things that's yeah. not going to take, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you can squish something to death with it, but used appropriately, this will get you that glue and it will get like, you know, the uh, the little bit of pull together you need on a two bus and, you know, uh, if you like it on guitar is taking the edge off on a mix that maybe it's yeah. just a little bit, it's great on a mix. you know, it'll just kind of take that edge off. So I often think about... Uh, you know, the perfect situation where you have limitless amounts of money. You know, just having tons of these, just kissing everything. Stack of them, <laughs> yeah. Them, just yeah, going through. No problem, yeah. Multiple channels of this. But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, it's an interesting thing. I like working on gear, so like having the, the knobs paired together like that, yeah. working your way out is kind of like if you're sitting there listening to something and you're sitting between it, uh, it's a really nice thing to be able to kind of just page through things and, and have that Very symmetry in that. I think that's cool. And just sonically, it's just uh, a really great sounding piece. You know, it's that old phrase that I hate using, but it is an industry standard. You know, there's a handful of, there's probably like five or six things that if you have in a studio, people take you seriously. If you've got a U87, a very mu, you got a ten seventy three. There's just these things yeah. that everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah. This, this I mean, this, this means business. You know, sitting on top of a massive passive in a rack. You know, yeah. it's a pretty serious you know situation. So yeah, yeah. And we love Ivana. What a wonderful human being. So yes, amazing. So not the cheapest one to start with, but we're big fans, as you can tell. Okay, so next up is. I think it's my favorite compressor. Does all the stuff I needed to. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing on guitars. Use it on every vocal I've ever recorded. Snare drum. Snare drum, room. Yeah. Bass, yeah, all the stuff. Probably the Swiss Army knife of compressors for the most part. Outside of the one that's the, gonna come up in a minute. It does all, yeah. yeah. So. There is, there is a Swiss Army knife of compressors, which we will get to shortly. <coughs> but as far as classic Swiss Army knife, yeah, this, this is the one. It's basically, because it's a fixed threshold, meaning the more you turn it up, the more it compresses. It's just, here it is, comes up, gain, more compression. And frankly, the attack and release times are fast enough for modern recording. Where an LA-2A is not really a favorite of mine. I don't, I know people like the sound it imparts, but I can't stand the fact that the attack and release times are so slow. I, I will use in conjunction with one of these an LA-2A quite often, but these things from, I would say entry level, but still able to do the same stuff from the warm 
Purple's been doing this thing for many years successfully with a couple extra features, a link and an insert point so you can have a little more routing flexibility. Yep. And then this piece from UA has been in production for forever. And Three and, and a half million years, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the classic. We pulled these two out of the rack, as you can see why they're labeled. So I have very strong opinions on LEM76s. I think they're the most incredible. I tend to use them, I actually just turn them all to 20 to one. On a snare, I'm on four to one. On rooms, probably four to one. But I like to put an 1176 on the end of a chain. It's a, if it's a serial compressor, I put it on 20 to one and I set it up so it just taps. When those transients from another compressor get through, yeah. it just kind of catches them. It, to me, it's the ultimate end of a chain, especially with it used in conjunction with like a DBX 160 VU, which tends to be a little warm and a, can be a little grabby and occasional kind of transients go through. Yeah. This will capture those. And so I'm a big fan of this, either on its own or as a serial compressor. Another thing that's really important to me, the fact that I know, you know, one of my good friends who's also in Indiana, Michael Stucker has his students build these. And the most expensive part of an LM76 is this, is the metal itself, the chassis. This is yeah. quite, you know, that actually costs quite a lot of money. But internally, the components are pretty inexpensive. I've been down that path. I built my own. I built the Hebbles. Uh, yeah, the Hairball uh, Blue Stripes. Uh, amazing for the price point. Uh, it was fun. One yep. of them didn't work for a while. Uh, <laughs> I figured it out. But, you know, the circuitry is so, like, established. You know, everyone has access to what's going on inside of these things. So it is a cool project to dive into yep. if you're looking to save some money on buying one, you could build one. Yeah, absolutely. But for me, the reason why I bring it up is blind test, the warms come up really, really close. Like, really, really close. And I think we were just looking, this is like $550. This is $2,600, the UA. And I think this was $1,850 for the purple. And this is as close, it's pretty darn close. Yeah. A fraction of a cost. So, even before I heard any real warm stuff across their range, the reason why I always rec and I've been recommending it for about seven or eight years, I'm, whenever they came out, I was like, buy this. If you want to get an 1176 and you want to enter in and find out how they work, why they're such a great compressor, this is the way to go in. It's 550 yeah. bucks. And that's, you know, that's one thing I got to say about all of these units is use your ears. Yeah. Uh, calibration on these is super tricky. Yeah. They're based on, you know, calibrating FETs inside of them. And so the meter can be calibrated, cannot be calibrated. It's all about the sound on these things. So yep. maybe it's not the same settings on this unit, but you can get the same sounds out of it compared to the other ones. Yep. And so that's really the thing is they do sound great. They do great stuff, but it's, it's all about understanding listening for it. Yep. So. Well, we're a fan of all three of these units. This is definitely incredible value for money and a great way to get into 1176 sound. The purple um, has a lot of gain. I tend to find that I'm bringing the input down quite dramatically. I, I can set these two fairly similar to get similar-ish results. Fairly similar, but this one I'm <laughs> cranking, the, I'm bringing the gain down and, you know, pulling the output back. They, they, they've got some good oomph behind them and obviously a wonderful unit. And possibly you could argue had maybe a little bit more crunch to this, a little bit more excitement. From my experience, almost every 1176 sounds slightly different or reacts yeah. a little bit differently. We totally dig these. They get, we employ both of these on sort of when we want to get some like vibey room mic stuff going yeah. on. It just depends on which ones we plug in. I mean, they're interchangeable to us. The link feature sometimes is cool when you're doing stereo stuff and you want to get it to grab together. That's a tricky thing to get a couple of these dialed in, so that's a nice feature. So my, my gut reaction, and having used all three of these, is like, if you've never used an 1176 before and you want to dip your toe in and you want your first hardware compressor, it's 550 bucks. Start here. If you have, you know, maybe a few of these and you want to start, you know, buying something that maybe is going to hold its value for a while and you want the UA name, the original then, yeah, cool, get one of these. It is 2600 but get one of these. Great thing. And then if you want something that's kind of got extra features and still incredible value for money, that's the purple. And I know JJ Blair, for instance, I think he has like a bazillion of these. He has a whole rack of these. He loves these. I feel like he has six, seven or eight of them, maybe more. And uh, he knows how to make them sound great. 
he's a great engineer. The Purple definitely has a very unique sound, but all in the same family. These are all in the same family, and the attack and release times can get so fast on them. You can have so much fun with this. You can push the input on it, get the fastest release time, and get it to be really percussive and aggressive. Audio destruction. Yeah. Really great. Yeah. You can do the all buttons in, you know, you can make it pump. You can do all kinds of fun things. This is definitely, if you're not yet familiar with hardware compression, I really honestly say this is the way to go. Get one of these. It's inexpensive. Learn how to use it and uh, have some fun because it's, it really is the sound of rock and roll. Like I was saying, guitars. I think somebody once said to me like a 57, 1073 and 1176 is the sound of so many of the most famous records. And then that same combination for a snare. Yeah, totally. And that, well, you can actually use these. There's enough gain in these to use them as mic preamps. Mic preamps, yeah. So that is a thing you can get, you can, you can mess with. But yeah, this is like, it's a classic piece, like we were talking about, like you walk into a studio and you see 1176s. It's like, yeah. that's just a thing. If you don't have 1176s, I don't know what you're doing. So yeah. it's a classic component. I think that this is, you know, it's just such a flexible tool to do so many cool things. So And gun to my head, if I walk into a studio and they only had a, a warm, it wouldn't bother me. Would it no. bother you? No. No. It's 1176. Yeah. That's a pretty good endorsement. You're like, oh, okay, they have a warm, they have 1176. I'm off to the races. So yeah, classic. All right, we're going to move into what I really strongly believe is the is the Swiss Army knife of compressors. Yeah, I misspoke. You're right. So this is the Swiss Army knife of compressors. Does it all. What is really interesting is every studio I've ever been to has one of these, and I love it, and I use them on every recording, every mix, and everything, and I don't actually own one. Oh. And the reason why I don't own one is because we have 1176s, DBX-160s, LA-2As, LA-3As, Neve 2254. We have every compressor that it can do. So we never actually got around to buying a pair. But when people say to me, what should you get if you're starting off? I always say get 1176 because you'll learn it. But this is probably like the one compressor if you only had one compressor. First compressor I bought. Oh, really? Yep. Like, you started off, woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I always have my eyeballs on this. I've, I <laughs> I knew what it did. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Hager. Uh, enlightened, we love Paul Hager. Enlightened me into what this was. And uh, yeah, I ended up, I think I had four of them at one point. Look but at you. Yeah, having fun. It does everything that a compressor could ever want to do. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, you can you you can choose where you want to detect it. If you want to let the low end go through, and and yeah, you can do absolutely everything. Um, it's got a nuke function, which is absolutely insane. Its attack and release times are as fast as as possible. Also, very easy to recall, which is a yeah. thing that we didn't really touch on a lot of the other yeah. stuff. But you know, if I want to be at five point six. It's yep. right there. So that's a that's a big thing. Well, if, everyone needs five percent. Well, you know, that's what sounds the best. <laughs> but you know, if you are working in a hybrid workflow or doing recalls and stuff like that, like that's the thing, working in outboard gear into a, a digital workflow, this is a great piece because you can recall super easy. It's an amazing compressor. If you only had one compressor type to choose, I'd probably choose this over an eleven seventy six. Not because an eleven seventy six isn't the classic greatest compressor ever made. It is, but this can do, I can make this do 160-ish things. I can make this, do, I can make this do anything. And you know, the the distortion features on that yeah. too, then turn it into a color box, the yeah, way you yeah. drive it, like, you know, not having a threshold, but being able to push it and just yeah. kind of make things happen. It's one of those things, especially I think having a box like this in your studio, if you're getting into starting to use hardware compression, learning how to hear compression, this box allows you to kind of like really get a feel for what it does and, and how to sort of, you know, develop your skill set around that. It's quite substantial, by the way. It might only be one you, but... So <laughs> I have, a, I have a great distressor story. Uh, I used to, used to tour with them when I was mixing the Counting Crows. Uh, yep. So I had a really rough ride in the truck. My gear got put on the back end of the truck and I had a bunch of stuff break. Yep. Uh, this was in a rack. Yeah. 
completely sheared off from the front panel, so the back part of this whole unit was hanging in the rack by the ribbon cables. Worked perfectly fine for a show. I didn't find out till the next day. Uh, <laughs> the, the whole back part had broken off, still worked totally fine. So uh, 100%, uh, two right. thumbs up for Robust, works all the time. I've never had one go wrong. I've been in 100 studios with them in, maybe more, and I've never seen one go wrong, but I can think of lots of pieces of gear that, that I've, I've had them go wrong on recording sessions. Yeah, it's ne- the, the distressor's broken is something I've never heard said before, yeah. so uh, that's also something to be said about buying gear and knowing that it's going to last for a long time and work really well. So I think the way I would describe, outside of the distortion, forget about that for a second, the way I would describe why this is so good is I can make it very, very visible or very invisible. I can get there and I can drive it pretty hard so it's starting to compress quite heavily. And then I can just get that attack and release time to just be right so that it's just catching the transit enough and not grabbing on for too long that if I go in and out of bypass, I can fear, hear something move forward as I hear the compression on it, but I don't hear it choke. It can be invisible or it can be very visible. Yeah, that's what no, and it, it goes the other way yeah. really well too. But yeah. that is, you know, there's not a lot of boxes that you can turn turn on and off or put bypass in and out that will control a signal as well as this will. I know Brower had, I don't know, 10, 12, 20, I don't know, so many of these in a rack and he was using them on the British mode and just getting them to do that flash, that kind of pop, 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 yep. kind of, ex- that kind of like really, really fast kind of exaggerate the transient, blend it back in kind of mode, which was really, really cool. And of course the new Connie, I've done that on mono room mics at studios, just so it's like, <laughs> It's like yeah, it's, energy on a drum kit. It is definitely a destructive component of this, but it's super creative, and I, I can you can get so many cool sounds out of this box. And uh, yeah, I don't know anything about what's going on in here. I don't know what it's based on. I don't know anything about. I think it it's some secrets. I'm not sure, but I I, I don't know either. I've, well, I've been inside of the one of them when mine snapped off, but yeah. outside of that, I've never had to fix one, so it's it's all good. Yeah, this is the Swiss Army Knife of Compressors. It's interesting you went for it first. I, I would say start off with the inexpensive 1176 to learn basics of it, and this would probably be... I, I someone the price. was like, you know, this is what you need. So that was where I went, but... Uh, Maybe but somebody you, who's mixed quite a lot, knows their plugins, knows how attack and release times work, know about fixed fix threshold compression, stuff like that. Maybe if you've got a little bit of knowledge in that way, this could be an easy switch over. But I think if you're a beginner and you barely know how a compressor works, it, it, it's a, this would probably confuse the snizzle out of you. Yeah, there's a lot of options. Yeah, there's probably too many options. Yep. Of all these compressors, if budget's not a, a problem, this is, this is easily the most versatile compressor we're gonna talk about. Two of them linked together as a bus compressor too, does really great stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's just very, very flexible. Yeah, wonderful piece of equipment. Okay, so when it comes to bus compression, I don't know if there is a more famous bus compressor for mixing than, of course, the SSL G Comp. Here, of course, is a 500 series version. There are so many iterations that they made, but this, it's got to be the sound of almost every, everything. I think there was a period, they said something like 78 when the 4000 came out. I think I'm getting a year wrong, probably. Up to like 2000 and something that 90% every of the commercial hits. song yeah. and hit was mixed on an SSL. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I had a 6K for a while. You I had a 4K and a 6K more. kind of. Yeah. And I mean, podge. the sound of like just dropping this in yeah. on that console just takes it to that spot where you want it. And it does. At first, though, I want to, it's, this is a whole other sideline conversation, but I, I fancy doing The first time I started using SSL bus compressors, I didn't like them. I did not like them because I was kind of Nevy. I had a Cadac, Calrec. Okay. I, I, I had these things, and I, I liked a, a big, fat sound. I liked things kind of poking their heads out just enough. And, and the first thing it did, and then I also didn't, I didn't realize that actually the release times are completely useless. You really, most of the time, you should start off on auto, see what it does, yeah. and then see if you can slightly improve upon it. And I tried really hard to, like, because I would read all those things, you know, Brow would say things like, you know, it's all about getting the release time to be in time with the music. And which doesn't make any sense, of course, because if you get two kicks going, ba boom, kick. Yeah, it's fine if it's like kick, snare, kick, snare, then you can make the release time work. But as soon as you do, 
the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. I, I would try to be really super clever with it, and I would always just kind of make the mix kind of sound like it, not necessarily pumping, but... Just kind of awkward? Awkward. It just didn't sound good. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I, what's wrong with SSLs? I don't get it. I'm crazy. I can't make it happen. And then I set it on auto, and I started playing with the attack, and just have it just dance around and suddenly it did that thing it glued it together and it started to make sense it's well i i think i struggled with finding the attack times i was a 10 and 3 yeah and then you know finding that the auto really did something musical yeah that it was engaged properly and you were kind of digging in i'm you know i sometimes see people where the needle's just buried and like Really? I'm like really all about like oh. if it's just knocking, we're in good shape, which is yeah. you know a good practice when you're working like on a stereo yeah. bus. You're not gonna want to just decimate that with compression. But you know, uh, fast attack, fast release, taking the transients off of drums yeah. does yeah. a really cool yeah. thing too. This version has a high pass filter, which so I always wanted on my SSL. I was always like, I could never because SSLs are famous for their mid range and their high end. It's just you get in there, you sculpt it, you get everything, you get some real spankiness. Paul, uh, you know, I haven't spoken to a while in years, but Paul was the one that taught me how to use an SSL. Right. Because I would, I would compress an EQ. And he's like, nope, EQ and compress. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? He's like, go in there, get that snare, make it super bright, make it too bright, push it into compression, push the, the channel out button, and suddenly that pow, pow, pow. It's like, oh, that's an SSL snare. Yeah, and that's what that, that's what that sound, and then finishing all that stuff off with yeah. this is like a big, big part of that so yeah. yeah and even this yeah this one has actually more different ratios so the expanded version of this in the 500 is pretty cool like i mean i had a rack mount i had a smart c2 for a yeah. while too and all variants on this stuff but this is like an awesome piece if you're mixing outside the box if you're doing like hybrid stuff doing an yeah. insert on the two bus this is going to bring you the glue that you're looking for so we, we did just pick up a 500 series the reality is is like you can get the, you can get the, the rack mount version 19 inch rack SSL 4000 bus compressor is, to me, is, is the sound of rock. But yeah, the high pass uh, feature is really, really powerful because there's a one thing I was saying earlier, you know, of an SSL is just like it, it can never quite get the low end. And I remember talking to Shelly Yakis about that, who mixed on SSLs, mixed so many great records. And I was talking, I remember listening to Under a Blood Red Sky, which was the live U2 record he did. And I loved the sound of that live record. When it came out, it was like one of the best sounding live records I'd ever heard. And um, I was like, how did you get the low end? And he said, on the SSL, he would insert API line amps on the bass guitar and on the kick and anything that had like, he said, because it just needed that kind of toughness, not that sponginess, which I like on SSL. Yeah. You know, it kind of gets a little spongy sounding. He would add that toughness back in, but that is a big plus. And not a slouch when it comes to tracking too. I mean, yep. you can do cool things with drum stuff, um, any sort of stereo keys, cool to run through these things. And I think we forget this, because I'm always talking about how Hugh Padgham and Steve Lillywhite made some of the best sounding records of all time. And I sit down and I ask them questions and I find out they would track through SSLs. Oh, yeah. All those Peter Gabriel great sounding records. <clears throat> it's the mic pre's on the SSL as well. We're always like, Neve API mix on an SSL. They were tracking and mixing those incredible records so, on an SSL. Yeah, I mean, the compressors, the dynamics in the SSL plus the EQs are so flexible. Like, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it is uh, a super flexible tool. SSL has always done that. That's been, you know, it just, you can do so many things with it. This thing here, I don't know, iconic. Yep, amazing. So this is rather fortuitous. <laughs> Today, this got shipped over here. And we got to try it out. So. Ignoring this for a second, it doesn't exist at the moment. This is one of the most famous compressors in the entire world. I was talking to Jason Joshua I don't know, uh, last year, I think it was or earlier this year, and Jason, hi Jason by the way, we're doing a panel together uh, in Studio Zainer in Germany in a couple of weeks. So Jason said that when he was assisting at Larrabee, because he paid his dues, he did years yeah. as an assistant, he said, no matter what the genre was of the mix that came through, and he was talking about Dave Way and Manny Marroquin, of course, who, who, who still mixes out there, actually owns it now, he yep. owns Larrabee. And all these different world-class mixers would come in, 
whether they were doing death metal, pop, punk, hip hop, whatever, they all put this on their vocal when they mixed. This was their vocal compressor. So, when we were assembling the top five compressors, it had to be in there. Then, today, well actually yesterday night, yeah. but today we got to use a brand new unit, which I assume will already have been out, and you may have already seen our review. And you've tested it as well, so I'm going to waffle yeah. on a bit. It's remarkably close. When you say everyone throws it on vocals, I mean, that is a thing. This is known for tracking vocals, mixing vocals, getting it to sit in a mix. And so, like, this is, like, iconic. I mean, you see this blue. You kind of know what's going on. This thing is pretty, pretty darn close, close to that. Pretty darn close, but particularly when you consider... Now this is about just shy of 4,000. I think it's like 30, yeah. 35 to 4,000, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. Something in that price range. And you were saying that people were reselling brand new ones for up to 6K. That's what Reverb. I heard. Reverb is, uh, you know, you can get yourself a new one in a box for around $6,000. So uh, yeah, they're hard to come by. They're they're slowly being, they're not being made very quickly. And so people, high demand for those. Uh, and this is coming in at about 1,000. I think that's $1,000. Yeah. So this is what this is what I discovered testing it for vocal tracking and for softer uh, ratios, you know, around about three to one, four to run. It got pretty darn close, pretty like the only difference when we imagined it on a on a PAS was actually. And this is what confused Michael Rango. This one was a little warmer. Maybe that's why it's called that. No, it had a little bit more low lows, a bit more 200, and slightly, and when I mean slightly, like slightly less 5K. So it actually came across as a little bit warmer sounding, not a lot of difference, but I could match the attack and release times at around about three, four, five in this kind of area. And when I played about to Michael Rango, some vocals, he thought this was this because he associated this kind of warmer tone. These are really being, clean units. Like they yeah. sound like there's not a huge tonal impart, which is what keeps the vocal sounding quite nice. So maybe a little heavier handed through yeah. this, which is, you know, not a bad thing, but yeah. a little different. Uh, I found that this was faster. It is faster. It's a faster attack and release. You don't really notice until you push it. So what we did is we went, 10 to 1 on both. We used it in, some argue the 10 to 1 is a limit. I'd just say it's just aggressive compression, but whatever. Went 10 to 1 and pushed it hard, cranked the, uh, the threshold a little bit and started to grab it a little heavier. And then you could tell with the fastest attack and release time that this was faster. And, that, and that's always, you know, this thing always... It kind of spooks me sometimes when it like grabs onto something really quick because that's yeah. that is it's one of the fastest things that you know which for tube is always like yeah. mind blowing. So that is it's kind of cool that this is like a little slower because sometimes this one hits a little too hard for yeah. me. And you know this is great to see that there's another option for this uh, iconic piece. You know another thing you know walk into a studio see one of these you know you know you know it's for real. And, I mean, what I was saying on, on camera, and I, I quite strongly believe, see what you think of this. I said if this was like pink and green and purple and had weird knobs on it and stuff and had some made up kind of boutique name like Schmidig whatever, <laughs> people would be freaking out. Yeah, it, it's a spectacular sounding compressor. It's a Just, really... I mean, outside of what it's paying homage to, it is a great sounding compressor. It's a great sounding compressor, yeah. yeah. And it's between one quarter and one sixth of the price, depending how you buy one. So either way, this was gonna be originally about the CL1B. That was gonna be in our top list of compressors. And it just so happened that this came in like the day that we're doing this and we did a shootout between the two. Really, really wonderful stuff. Classic compressor on pretty much every other record ever made and something that comes pretty darn close for a fraction of the cost. I think the only thing we can talk about now is just an honorable mention. And the reason why we're not gonna pull up any one particular thing is the 670 and the 660 Fairchild. There's so many people that make clones of them and, and I feel like it would be unfair. We were able to bring up lots of different 1176s. If we were to showcase one. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great 
recreations and things that pay respects to yeah. the Fairchild. Um, Honorable mentions probably Wade's. Yeah, the 660 that uh, Chandler does is, is awesome. We've been using it a ton around here. Yeah, the um, phenomenal sounding. Yeah, uh, the Heritage has got a couple of the 660 and 670 Herchilds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so lots of options out there. The one thing that I've found being in studios that have original units, they're all quite different. They all kind of have their own magic. So it's... You know, it's hard to kind of put your finger on a co comparison, yeah. but obviously an iconic piece in, in major studios all over the world. Yeah, so. exactly. And very, very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, prohibitively expensive. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. So long, farewell, Avise. What are your particular compressors and limiters that you love? Please leave them down below. See you all soon. Goodbye.